What I decided to do, we're about halfway through the year, and I thought what I'll do is I'll go starting with in January, and I would go through the PowerPoints and the ones that stood out to me that I think we need to remember the most, I put them on here. And so we're going to start out going through PowerPoints. Actually, it's a review of the highlights, the major points that we've gone through. Not all, not all of them uh, come from our study on Sunday of major Bible events. A few of them have to do with our study of Philippians during the week. So we're going to start here. Uh, George, can you turn this, yeah, this, this the middle ones. First, first, first one on your, no, the way. There you go. There you go. Y'all probably won't be taking notes here, and these all were my head, too. There you go. All right. Because I want them to stand out, and y'all can still see to take notes if you want to, right? Okay. All right. This was the first one that I had in January. Isn't it wonderful that we don't have the burden of coming up with solutions to the problems we face in life? You might say, whoa, 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 whoa. what? What do you mean we don't have problems? I didn't say that you don't have problems. All God's children and all children that, that are not God's have problems. And if this was an amen in church, there would be amen that's flying off the walls. Isn't that true? <laughs> I'm not looking for an amen, I'm just saying. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful? You don't look like it's wonderful. That we have the burden, of, we don't have the burden to come up with solutions to the problem we face in life. And why is that? Because God is in the solution business. That's what He does. He provides solutions to those who seek Him, those who ask Him for help with their problems. So God is in the solution business. We are in the trusting business. That's what it amounts to. And I'm so glad that those roles aren't reversed. And that most people, even most believers, live their life as if they were. So we trust. It's much easier to trust the Lord and to go to Him in prayer and just pour out your soul to Him as what is on your plate at any given time than it is to try to think about solutions. There's no neutral in our spiritual transmission. Now we all have a spiritual transmission. I don't know where it is. <coughs> I don't know what it looks like, but we have one in a theoretical sense. There's no neutral in our spiritual transmission. We are either going forward, growing as we daily take in the Word, or we are going backwards, retrogressing back into the old, comfortable wheel ruts of human viewpoint and daily being defeated by mental attitude sins lusts, and the details of life. That describes every one of us. Uh, I assume all of us are believers. If you're not, then just hang in there and wait till the end, and I'll tell you how to become a believer, how to gain the knowledge, the assurance that you're going to spend eternity in heaven. But we don't usually think about these things, and one reason is because the last thing mentioned in this in this PowerPoint. There it is. I knew I had one up here. Right here. The details of life. All of us have deep details we have to manage. And that's part of life. But the details are not our life. And as we go through dealing with the details of life, our number one touch mark or touchstone <coughs> is our spiritual life. And what we do is we take the things that we have learned in God's Word, we call it Bible doctrine, and we apply it to our situation, whatever it may be. And most of the time it's the details of life. But you may have noticed that when you are dealing with the details of life, sometimes you come across 
nasty people, people who are rude, people who are antagonistic. They're rude. And during that time, that's when, because you're thinking divine viewpoint, I have to make this clear. All believers are either going forward or backward in their neutral life. A lot of people think, well, I haven't gone to church in a while, and I really haven't studied my Bible in a while, I don't pray very much, but I'm on a plateau. I'm just holding. I'm in a holding pattern. No, you're not. You're in reverse, and it's escalating. And you have human viewpoint, which I call stinking thinking. And most people walk around, and if you could smell what they're thinking, you would give them a wide berth. It's human people. It's natural. This is what people think. It's called human viewpoint. But God doesn't want us to think that way because we can't live the abundant life. We can't be happy. We can't be confident. We can't have courage. We can't have confidence. We can't have anything with stinking thinking. And that's what people are doing who are in reverse in their spiritual life. So, they don't understand that Each day they wake up, it's going to be another day after another after another of defeat when they could have victory. And it all starts with humility. First of all, you have to be humble enough to understand that you don't have this life. I I, I don't know if I can do it the way young people do it. I don't even know if they do this anymore. But I used to say, uh, can can you manage with so-and-so? Oh, yeah, I've got this. I've got this. Well, that's the way people think about life. I've got this. They've got nothing but insanity in their soul if they're not thinking divine viewpoint. The only way you can think divine viewpoint is to have divine knowledge that consistently comes into your soul. It takes over the command post of your soul, which is called the cardia, the heart. So people get comfortable with their old ways, old habits, and they want to stay there. But if you are searching for answers, if you're seeking God, then you're not going to be comfortable in those old wheel ruts for very long. Because the Word of God is alive and powerful, and it will shake you out of the doldrums and challenge you to look at who you really are and your complete and utter dependence upon your Creator and the Lord Jesus Christ. When confidence in God goes, faith and hope go. And then morale goes. What is left is a miserable, defeated believer. I've got about three or four slides here on confidence. It's not just confidence in yourself. That's what they pander on TV and everywhere else. You need to believe in yourself. Yeah? Well, go ahead. See how that works for you. Those are people who think that they can face life without God. We're talking about confidence in God. Now, how do you suppose that you can maintain confidence? Because notice I said when confidence in God goes. What do you mean? How how can it go? I believe in God. I have confidence in God. Yeah? How strong is that confidence? Do you automatically go to him when you have issues? Are you confident that you can trust him? That you can put all your woes and worries on him and then forget them? Because they're now his problems. What happens is the pressure of trouble and woes and adversity intrude into your soul where they're not invited but they intrude anyway, do they not? How many of us have ever been at peace and said, you know what, I think I'll just invite this uh, woes and tribulation into my soul. It just, it just appears, doesn't it? When I think of this, what's going through my mind right now is my garden. You think, what in the world is he talking about his garden? Well, if you saw my garden, I have weeds literally taller than myself. How many of those do you think I planted? Huh? Do I I go out there and cultivate those weeds? Now, last year I had 
planted some things. I don't see a hiding a hair of those. Why don't they come up? Weeds. That's what that's what it is when it intrudes into our soul. They're not invited, they just show up. So when I'm talking about confidence, when notice I didn't say if. When confidence goes, because we all start to get distracted and from time to time we kind of falter in our confidence towards God. So what this what this is saying is when confidence in God goes, there are repercussions. There are consequences. One, faith and hope go. How can you live this life without faith? How can you live it without hope? Actually, your faith doesn't really go. It changes. It changes from faith in God to faith in whom? Moi. Right? Ourself. I got this. I can handle this. Huh. You're a comedian to think that. And then morale goes. You're down, it used to be you, you, you were, you got the blues. And that doesn't re resonate with anybody that's not a senior citizen these days, I don't, I don't imagine. Uh, you're down in the dumps. There's just something wrong. Uh, what, uh, Rachel, what, what do young people, do they have a term now for being down? Is that, I know in the sixties it was a downer. You, you, do you know any? That one? See, the reason she doesn't know because she's never down. <laughs> or rarely. Morale goes. You just, the, the, the spark is gone. And what is left is a miserable, defeated believer. And when you're not taking in the word, when you're not thinking divine view, viewpoint, that's what you are every single day. Now you go through life and day after day, and people may not notice this. You may know since something is not right. But I'm telling you, you lost your confidence in God. Here is a definition of confidence. It's a good one. Confidence. It's full trust, belief in the powers, trustworthiness, or reliability of a person or thing, certitude, assurance that in which faith is put. And of course we know what this is talking about. Trustworthiness, reliability of a person. It's not a thing, it's a person. It's the Lord Jesus Christ is who we put our faith in, our trust. I hope that, and I've told you this before, and I don't think it'll ever happen because I've already told you so many times, you'll never say this in front of me. You won't, I don't think any of you're not going to say it to me, but if I'm around I heard you say it, and you knew I was there, you wouldn't say it. And this is what I'm talking about. If I'm ever around any of you and someone asks, well, are you saved? Are you going to heaven? And you say, I hope so. You better start running. Where's the assurance? Where's the confidence? I have been known on occasion when someone asked me that. I don't know how righteous it is or how holy it is, but I said, you're damn right I'm saved. And I'm going to heaven. You know, you get this big stare. Now, I'm not, I'm not advising you to do that. I'm just trying to make a point. There's no doubt that they know. And I've had people say, oh, you really think pretty highly of yourself, don't you? Now, that's a sign. They don't have a clue how to get to heaven. They know the gospel or anything else. They don't know what grace is. I said, no, I don't think so highly of myself. I think about highly of the one who saved me. And we go from there. So, that's a definition. Now, isn't that a pretty, doesn't that give you solace there? I found a way to get some new backgrounds, so get ready. I don't even have to put anything. I just move on now, can I? <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35 through 36 says, Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. 
Now, this verse is stunning in its simplicity, but also the grace that is involved there. And it all depends on confidence. Now, I'm not talking about arrogance because the confidence is not in yourself. Every person here, and all those live streamers that are listening, have to know how important that is. Because if you are facing life without confidence, confidence in God, then you're a miserable person. You will be eaten alive by fear and worry and dread. But it doesn't have to be that way. So, I'm going to ask you a question. Don't answer it out loud. It says, do not throw away your confidence. So, how does one throw away your confidence? Your confidence in God's Word. Your confidence in Him. I mean, you don't wake up one morning and think, I, have, I think I've had enough of this confidence and I'm just going to throw it in the trash. It's, that's not how it happens. But how does one not throw away their confidence? So it doesn't say, it, it, this is in the, the positive in the sense, don't throw it away. But people throw it away all the time and they don't even realize it. They don't purposely do it. Maybe they had confidence at one time, but now it's lacking. And what is it that replaces confidence? When it's lacking, when you throw it away, it's not just nothing there. The vacuum sucks in something. What is it? Fear. Do you want to live a life full of fear? Worry and dread? So the way that people lose their confidence is by not maintaining it. And how do we maintain it? Well, you're maintaining it right now. You're listening to the Word of God. It's alive and powerful. It goes into your soul and it gives you that confidence and you go out into this world of madness, of people who are confused and angry. And you just stand out like a shining light. You're not angry at anybody. You're not afraid. It's not an arrogance that you've got this. The thing is that God, God, I don't know if this is good English or not, God, God's got you. And you, the only way you can maintain that confidence is by consistently learning God's Word. Get into that Word. He is speaking to us through His Word. We are commanded in Hebrews chapter 10 to Assemble ourselves together for the study of God's Word. And every time something comes in between that, you suffer. And your confidence starts to wane. One more thing. It is absolutely impossible for anyone to maintain their confidence if they're not consistently, daily, taking in God's Word. Oh, but I don't have time for that. <laughs> oh, really? You don't have time to get into God's Word, even if it's just for 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever it is? People just don't understand the cost. They don't understand what they're losing when they do that. Oh, a wall. Confidence and ignorance are mutually exclusive. You see, confidence is built on knowledge. And when you have knowledge of God's Word, you have power. I'm not talking about power the way that politicians use power. I'm talking about power to maintain your confidence and not be afraid and not be worried. You have courage. You have Everything that you want, security in your soul, that's, that's what we have. So confidence and ignorance are mutually exclusive. You can't have, if you have one, you do not have the other. Proverbs chapter 8 verse 33 through 35. I want you to go there in your Bibles. Proverbs chapter 8 verse 33 through 35. And if y'all can't see it in here, I'll have them turn the lights on. 
The reason I'm having you go there is because I you may see I have some things in brackets that will help this to be understood better. What what do you say? Can y'all see? Huh? A little bit? Turn on the lights there for a minute, George. How about now? Okay. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 33 through 35. Heed instruction and be wise. Most people don't even get to the heed part. See, to heed instruction, you have to already have received instruction, don't you? Most people are shot down on the very first word when it says heed instruction and be wise. They can't heed what they don't know. And they got other things that are so much more important than getting instructions from God on how to live this life. Heed instruction. And by the way, this is not a suggestion. Prepare to move. Heed instruction and be wise and do not neglect it. And then I have in brackets the it we call Bible doctrine. It's God's Word. It's Scripture. Verse 34. That's the command. That's what we are to do. Now there is a result of that. If you do this, if you do heed instruction, and if you heed instruction, you're going to be wise and do not neglect it, Bible doctrine. Verse 34. Blessed is the man who listens to me. Now, this is part of Proverbs where the word wisdom is personified as if it was a person, as if it was a female. And so, if you listen to me, which in the scriptures are called, it's referring to wisdom personified, but wisdom personified we call Bible doctrine. Because there are a lot of people who are well, let me, let me rephrase that. Not a lot. There are some people who are really smart. They're very intelligent. But their intelligence doesn't get them any closer to God. Many times it's a hindrance. But wisdom comes from God, from the Scriptures. And I'll take wisdom over intelligence any day. Doesn't mean you don't you don't you don't have to have intelligence. We all have a, 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 a amount of wit, of, of uh, intelligence, but wisdom is far superior. You can have you know a lot of things, a lot of facts, and all this. Wisdom is the prize. So blessed is he who listens to me, Bible doctrine, God's word, watching daily at my gates. I want you to underline daily. You don't gain wisdom from God's word by saying, uh, let's see, I don't know where to go in the Bible, I'll just open it. I'll go here. You read the scripture? Okay, now I have wisdom. That's not the way it happens, is it? Watching daily at my gates. By the way, the gates in the ancient world is where the trials were held and, and business was done. Waiting daily at my gates. Then what? Waiting at my doorpost, not just out in the in the city, not just out around people at the gates, but also at my doorpost at your house. So this would be out in civil life, but also in home life. Waiting at my doorpost, and then verse thirty-five: For he who finds me, Bible doctrine, wisdom, finds what? Life. Is that not powerful? What that suggests is if you don't find wisdom, if you're not daily watching or uh, listening to me, watching daily at the gates and at the doorposts, if you're not doing that, then you don't have life. Oh, but I'm still here. I'm breathing. I have a life. That life is so inferior to the life of one who has wisdom from God's Word and applies it to his life, can't even be called life. 
And people don't recognize that. For he who finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But what about these people? Now let's just look. We're not talking about unbelievers. What about all the believers who don't do this? They're not heeding instruction and they are neglecting the study of God's word. We're talking about believers. They're not blessed because they're not listening, watching, and waiting with regards to God's word. So what does God think about that? If he, if people who do this find favor from the Lord, those who do not, what happens to them? They're not finding favor from the Lord. Many times it comes in the form of divine discipline. And that can be ratcheted up and get unbearable. All this has to do with, what's that first word up there? Confidence. Confidence in God. Confidence in doctrine produces courage, poise, and certitude. How many of you would like to have courage in everything that you face? We'd all like to have that, don't we? Well, aren't there certain things that, uh, I don't want to go there. Could you do that for me? How would you like to be bold and not be afraid of anything or anyone? And I'm not talking about a braggadocious, bully idiot. I'm talking about a humble person who is depending on the Lord and the Lord goes with him everywhere he goes. He has, he's fearless because he knows that the, he's a God's child. He's a child of God. He's a royal family member, and he has courage, not only in battle, but also moral courage to stand up to all the idiocy. And boy, is there not a, is there a lot of idiocy going on today? Half our country is insane. And they hate God, they hate Christ, Christians, they hate His Word. You don't have to go far for your courage to kick into gear. And poise. What is poise? I think I don't know, I might be wrong on this, but ladies, you that are a little older than the... Uh, I, um, I'll just stop there. Um, <laughs> did they ever teach poise? In, I mean, they had uh, what, what glamour tree, uh, what do they call it? Uh, they would teach you things. Was, wasn't poise one of the things? I mean, you, you have to walk with a book on your head, you know, uh, with that and how what far to use and all these manners it wasn't poise part of it poise means you can just be very relaxed in any situation that's what it means to me is, is that close ladies is, i mean you don't get all upset you don't get in a dither you you can be thoughtful and considerate even around people that Think that we ought to. Well, I can't say all I want to say. Let's just put it this way: you relax in every situation. Don't wouldn't you like to be that way? And certitude, certitude is lacking among so many Christians. Do you know why it's not lacking? In the left, the nut jobs. What they lack in wisdom, they make up for in certitude. They're certain about everything. The world's going to end in 12 years. You heard that one? Was there any doubt in, the, oh yeah, just 12 years, we're, we're toast. Or the, the, in, those that, I, it's nearly an axiomatic thing that those who know the least speak the loudest. <laughs> and they have more certainty about what they think they know but I'm saying to be able to be confident and not confused. There's so many issues and so many areas that impact our life. For us to be able to say, for instance, let me, let me think of an example here. Um, let's say that, uh, well, there's, there's things going on where they want to have uh, girls in high school have to share their lockers and their showers and their dressing room with men. But boys, males. 
Now, you would think common sense would tell you that that's insane. But there are some believers who address that and think, well, it must be okay. Or some people say, well, the government demands that we have to do it. Or how about in the, what is it, the Episcopalian church, they have homosexuals that are outwardly and pronounced homosexuals who are behind the pulpit. A lot of people will think it's okay because those churches have people going to them. Isn't it great to be able to say, that is wrong, I will not accept it, or I will not do it. And they say, well, huh, who do you think you are? I'm nobody, but I know what God thinks. That is wrong. You see, you don't hear people saying, oh, that's right or wrong anymore because we live in a postmodern world. Postmodernism means we live in a society, for the most part, that there are no absolutes. And whenever you, be, whenever you start being absolutely factual and dogmatic about something, they don't like it. They say, oh, well, that's your truth. <laughs> I laugh. You ever hear people today say, oh, well, that's his truth. Or that's my truth. There's only one truth, and God has cornered the market on it. He has monopolized. He's a monopoly on truth. And so the more dogmatic... Now, don't be an ass. Don't be a jerk about it. Don't be a big, boisterous, you know, know-it-all. But you can very calmly say, that's wrong. And the reason it's wrong is because God says it's wrong. So certitude. And it's not an arrogant thing, but it's something that gives you assurance. It's so, so wonderful. You should be grateful for those things that you can speak out on because of what God's Word says. And you can say, that is wrong, thus saith the Lord. Certitude. All we hear, no, just step up and say it. There's a difference between having confidence that you know doctrine and having confidence in the doctrine you know. Now, a lot of you have been reared on doctrine and you're confident that you know doctrine. And you do know doctrine. But really what this is saying, knowing it and applying it are two different things. You only apply the doctrine that you have confidence in. You're confident that you have doctrine, and you know, you know a lot of theology, you know about eschatology, Christology, soteriology, homardiology. I could go down the list and you can say, I'm with you all the way. But it's the application that is missing. And that's having confidence in the doctrine you know, because you're not going to apply any doctrine unless you are confident about it. Because sometimes you have to stick your neck out and there is risk involved when you stand up for what you know in the doctrine. And some people won't do it. They know it, but they won't do it. I don't know if this is my last slide or not. Let's see. Nope. Got an, oh yeah, I remember what's coming up next. Boy, did I ever pound on this one. God will provide. You remember when we were in... Uh, this, this is the part where we have the, one of the, I guess the most profound tests in the Bible. When Abraham had to, was, was commanded by God to sacrifice his son, his only son, the son that he loved, Isaac. And what did Abraham say? When his son asked him as they were walking towards where they were going to build an altar where Abraham was going to sacrifice his son on that altar, what did Abraham say when Isaac said, well, here's the wood and we have the altar. Where is the sacrifice? Of course, he was the sacrifice. What did Abraham say? There it is right there. God will provide. Did Abraham know what God would do? 
Abraham didn't have a clue. For all he knew, when he sacrificed, when he was called on to sacrifice Isaac, that he brought the knife up and was about to plunge it into his chest. Right before he did it, of course, God stopped him. But as far as he knew, he was going to do it because he had complete faith that if he did sacrifice Isaac, that God would raise him from the dead. And this is prior to Christ going to the cross for us. Of course, it's all symbolic of that. So the next time that you're worried and you don't know how it's going to all play out, just remember, God will provide. We don't have to know the why or the when or the how because we know the who. A lot of times we get in these issues and, oh, we're all undone. And we want to know why. Have you ever heard people, they, 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 something, they, they break their leg or they, they have some kind of disease or whatever it is, some tragedy happens. What do they say? You know what they say. Why does this have to happen to me? Right? Of course, you've never said that. That's tongue-in-cheek, by the way. By the wind, this is the one so hard. Okay, we know the why, because God, God works all things together for good for those who love him. We understand that. We know the why. But what, what about the when? When do we want God to provide the solution? The after tomorrow? Next week? Huh? When do we want it? Now. Why can't he do it now? I've told you before, that used to be my, that log house over there used to be my log home office where I sold log homes. And when God decided it's time for me to get into the ministry and all, I put it up for sale. It was for sale for five years. And I got to the point, I thought, well, I went through, I caught, stopped using realtors because I would call them and they didn't even remember who I was. So I got another one. It was the same thing. Finally, I said, well, to heck with it. I'm not going to worry about it. My life can't go on till that is done, but if that's going to be it, I, that's fine. I'm not, it's just done. I wasn't turning it over to the Lord like I should have, but I said, I'm done. I don't care. I'm not even going to ask or care about whether it's, whether it sales or not. Within a week, someone came into my model home and said, we want to buy this house and we'll give you the price you're asking. Look at all that five years, all that time I was angry and embittered. Whose fault was that? Mine. The wind. And see, I know now, I can look back, and if it would have happened five years earlier, this church would not be here. God knew that. I didn't. All I was being like a little bang. Well, you know. I'm not known as an icon of patience anyway. <laughs> They're laughing, I know how true that is. God doesn't always solve our problems by changing our circumstances. Sometimes he does, and we're glad that he does. He can. He can do it at any moment. He can change our circumstances. Of course, I'm saying we're it, for granted that it's change it for the good. He might change it for the bad, for our good. Do you understand that statement? But God doesn't always solve our problem by changing our circumstances. Sometimes he resolves the problem by changing us. We're looking at our circumstances and we're gnashing our teeth. We think that's the issue. And God will show us, no, you are the issue. And sometimes problems linger because we hadn't figured that out yet. And God loves us enough to hang in there to where we finally have to depend upon him. That's a nice one, isn't it? Most believers who experience hard times and difficult circumstances focus on the problem and what must be done to eliminate it or to mitigate it so that it is manageable. Does that just, doesn't that describe you? It describes me. That's normal. That's the default, the, the, the fault position for 
People, forgive us, that's what we do. Whenever we face an issue, it may be adversity, tribulation, woes, trials, testing, whatever you want to call it, our first go-to place is that we want to see what needs to be done to eliminate it or at least mitigate it, change it, modify it to where we can at least manage it. Now, I'm not saying that that this is wrong. Spiritually, it's wrong. But this is what people do. It's normal. It's natural. But this next part, if you don't get this, you'll never get the whole thing about confidence and what I've been giving you here. What believers need to learn is the problem is not the adversity we are facing, but us. We are the problem. That's what God is showing us. He puts these things on our plate to deal with so that He can do two things. Two things He does whenever you have adversity. He allows it to come into your life. First of all, He's going to demonstrate to you His power, His might, and he's going to be glorified for what he does with your problem. And the second thing, so he gets the glory, but we get the blessing. We see him, his sufficiency, that he is able to take this problem that we give to him, and bang, it's gone. So in these problems, when we understand that it's not the adversity, it doesn't matter what it is, that's the issue. We are the issue. Are we going to trust Him with it? Or are we going to trust ourselves and make a mess out of it? Because He wants to be glorified by you by solving your problems, but you take them on yourself, and I take them on myself, and make a bigger mess of them. And some people never will go to the Lord with their problem because they're too arrogant. So here we are right here. But... It's not the adversity we are facing, but us. We are the problem. Now, here. We are not making... Why? What's, what's the deal? We are not making our requests known to God, which we are commanded to do in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6 says, Be anxious for nothing. But with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. And then verse 7, and he will give you the peace that passes all understanding in Christ. Boy, whew, is, that, is that big? And so we're the problem... The, the problem is because we're not making our request known to God. How is God going to step in, take care of our situation if we're so arrogant we're not even going to ask Him? What does it take to ask God for help? Humility. And we're so arrogant. And we haven't been feeding our soul. We're not even thinking in spiritual terms. And we just are undone by this adversity. So we're not making our requests known to God, so we are not trusting Him to deal with the unpleasant issue because we are dealing with it on our own. And how's that working for us? Up here? You can't let it go. It's like a, it's like a video that keeps running in your mind. You can stop it like that. I don't want any more videos running in my head about what am I going to do about the problem because I'm going to... It, through prayer, I'm going to tell God, I can't handle this. You have admonished me to give you the problem. By the way, how many people come to you and say, hey, I want to take your problems. What can I do for you? What problem do you have? I can solve them. Give them to me. How often does that happen? And even if it did, they can't do anything about it because they're in as big a trouble as you are. They're as weak as you are. But God says, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving says, give it to me. I'll show you what I can do. But we won't do it because we don't we don't turn them over to him. This is the last one, by the way. And it's good because we don't have much time. If we now this is the final one and it's the summation of all this. 
If we will concentrate on obeying God's command to be anxious for nothing. It is a command. Don't worry. And you say, okay. How? Am I not going to worry? Well, that's what we've been talking about. Anytime that God gives us a command, He gives us the ability to obey it. And by the way, this is in Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious about nothing but through prayer. Commit our problems to Him. And listen to this. And believe His promise that He will provide a way of escape. This is, this is so important. What verse is that talking about? 1 Corinthians 10.13 God promises us that if we depend on Him that we will not be overpowered and undone by that problem. The testing, it calls it testing. In your Bible it says tempting, but I showed a few weeks ago that it's better translation is testing. No testing has uh, come upon you that is not uh, common to man. But in he, he promises us that when we depend on Him, he will provide a way of escape. So this you're putting this together now. When we concentrate on obeying God's command, just be anxious for nothing. We're not, we're, we're not going to worry. But how do we do this? We do it through prayer. We commit our problems to Him. And we just not commit. It's one thing to say, okay, God, this is eating me alive. I, I, I can't do anything about it. But I know you can, so I'm committing it to you. It's your problem now. But this part is where this comes in. It says, and believe his promise that he will provide a way of escape. He has to provide a way of escape because he promises he will if you will trust him with it. What do we do in the meantime? Yeah, somebody said it. My least favorite word in the English language. Wait. We wait on him to provide the escape. We're not going to focus on the problem. That's his. That's done. So his promise that we will, he will provide a way of escape. Then here's another promise. When you're doing that, then he will, then we will experience the peace of God that passes all understanding. You want peace in your life? You want to not worry anymore? You want to live the abundant life? and not allow the circumstances to intrude into your soul and make you miserable. That's it. Right there. It's not complicated. The question is, do you believe it? The question is, will you do it? You would be a fool not to at least try it. Now, you probably won't be completely successful the first time, whatever it is that's eating on you. You go to the Lord with it. You've given it to Him. And you're going to wait for the escape, the way of escape. And that might last for 20 minutes. And then you say, oh God, I can't take it. here. I want it back. And you take it back and you start worrying again. <laughs> it didn't work. No, it worked. Until you decided what's happening. Your faith and your trust that He's going to provide a way of escape is weak. But the more that you do this, the more you trust Him with these things, the stronger that faith gets. And then you live the abundant life up here between your ears. That's where it is. Well, that's our last slide. I'm glad that we had the time to at least get to this point. I told Vidal, he says, how is this going to work? Is this going to be a major Bible event or what is it going to be? I said, well, I'll do a few of these. Uh, I'll do these. PowerPoints, and then I'll go on with major Bible events. He's so gracious. I think he was grinning up, up in his mind. He said, oh, yeah, right. So, the challenge is before you. And a lot is at stake. This will be on the website. I'm going to put it under PowerPoints. I don't know if I can put it on PowerPoints. I'll get it on there some way. Put it on the notes. That's what I'll do. Where you can go to the notes and this will be there. 
It's my custom to close with the gospel. Now, you've got a great opportunity before you for believers, but there may be someone here or someone live streaming that is not a believer. They're still struggling with what happens to, to me after I die. Well, I have not only good news, but great news. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He voluntarily went to the cross. He died twice on that cross. He died spiritually first, which is what paid for your sins. Then he died physically once his mission was completed. He was buried and he rose again and he offers eternal life to anyone. That means anyone who will trust him and him alone for it. It has nothing to do with how good you are. It has everything to do with his gracious offer of faith alone in Christ alone. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ and not in your own works for eternal salvation, at that moment you're born again. You're born again spiritually. You become a royal family member of the Most High. Your ticket to heaven is guaranteed and now God expects you to grow up spiritually, learn how to execute the Christian way of life, and you will have great blessing and it will glorify God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for who and what you are that our point of contact you with you is grace. We thank you for your word that is alive and powerful. And that you in eternity past had this plan not only for the world, all people, but for each one of us individually. And you have a specific, wonderful plan designed specifically for us. And as we live out whatever amount of time we have left on this planet, we pray that we will have the good sense to seek you and praise you and love you and execute that plan. And we will live the abundant life here on earth and look forward to the super grace life that is so wonderful we can't even attain the thought in heaven with our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you will help us to Eliminate any distraction, any doubts, and meet the challenge through your grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.